Um, by the grace of God, I don't think any of us have the coronavirus, you know. I was asking Auntie Marissa if she, has any, if she has any cases at her hospital lately, you know. And I don't think she even, she hasn't even heard of any of those cases yet. So I, mean, I would understand that if there was a lot of cases, she would immediately know, right? Everyone would know. So praise the Lord that he's protecting our health. You know, uh, we, we, can't, we can't let that slide. You know, God is always blessing us each and every day. He's protecting our health. It's as though, like, um, when we go into the plagues in Egypt, you know how God make it, made a distinction between his people and, and Egypt and how he kind of sent the plagues on them, but there's this one circle that the plagues would never touch them. And so praise God. Maybe that's God's way of glorifying himself, that we are still healthy because by the grace of God. So praise the Lord. Um, <clears throat> So I got to uh, see Gombi. You know, remember Gombi? Remember my, my nephew? I call him my cousin, though. Apollo got Chalyan, you know. Um, so uh, he, he wants to make a, a huge decision in his life. I think he's going to be going to the Army. Um, he's going to be going through MEPS, I think, uh, this Monday. So keep him in your prayers. He wants to really pass. Um, his goal he is to, to be a police officer, so he signed up to become to go into the infantry. Uh, my parents were, were talking, him, talking him out of it, you know, but, uh, but he wants to make a life for himself, and he aims to become the chief of police, so that would be kind of cool. I'd like to have somebody that's a chief of police, you know. That way I'd be like, hey, Paulo, can you, like, protect our church from active shooters? Send us some cops, right? So that would be pretty awesome. So uh, maybe later, probably around... I don't know, maybe April, March, we'll be seeing him. We'll be praying over him. So it was really, got, it was really good to see him. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to be reviewing our mission statement. I don't know why I didn't do this, but what I wanted to do was kind of do a karaoke with you guys, but I think it's going to take up too much time. So um, I want us to have a lot of time in uh, looking into sort of like our active shooter plan, as well as what sort of things uh, we should prepare for in case we go into a time where it's hard to find food, right? Uh, sort of like disaster, disaster, a disaster plan. Um, <clears throat> I, there was a guy that I follow on YouTube. I like him because he's an American, but he speaks fluent Chinese. So when he would... He, he's been living in China for about 10 years, so people don't expect him to speak fluent Chinese, so he'll talk in English to them, and they'll try their best in English, and next thing you know, he starts speaking to them in, like, Chinese, and they get all shocked, you know? And I like those kind of reactions. Well, he was in Beijing, and now he's in Washington, D.C. because of the coronavirus, and he was just kind of showing us uh, through his video what it looked like, and yeah, it looked like a ghost town, you know? Have you ever been to, like, an amusement park when, when nobody is around? Like, it just looks so empty? Well, that's what it looked like in Beijing. There was just nobody in the streets. And when you go to the store, it's so weird. Everyone is, like, coming in as though they were using, like, traveler's luggages. And they would put their food in there. And everyone was all, like, had their N95 masks and stuff, which is sort of like the standard um, to cover yourself. And... Um, yeah, um, they said, "Oh yeah, look, there's still some mask here. We still have stuff. We still have stuff on the shelf, but it looked like it was dwindling down because they have been in the standstill." And so, anyway, we don't know exactly what the repercussions are to the United States, but I think it's a good time to, like, you know, every once in a while, if you go to the store, maybe save your yourself a can of Spaghettios or something, you know, and just keep stocking up because you never know. You never know what might happen. And so uh, maybe one of the reasons why we've been doing the, this food ministry for about 10 years is that maybe it's getting us ready for this event too. And so uh, praise the Lord, we do have a lot of dry goods. As men, we're going to kind of set, kind of figure out what we should store and how we're going to store it, right? So we'll be talking about that. Um, so now um, what I want to do is uh, before we get into our sermon today, I want us to review our um, mission statement. Excuse me here. 
And so this is our mission statement, right? Faith Baptist Fellowship is a body of born-again and baptized believers dedicated to the pursuit of knowing and obeying God more in love and commitment and through the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit to bring the light of his love and salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to our community and elsewhere. So basically we are a church that pursues knowing God through his word and after knowing who he is, we show everyone who God is through our character and actions. And since Jesus is coming very soon, let us not take, his, let us not take this lightly and continue our pursuit of God through our daily devotions and Christ-like practice. Continue to store treasures in heaven because those things will last for, for eternity. Remember, Jesus is coming soon. So that last Sunday, we concluded the similitudes. Uh, Jesus said that we are the salt and the light. And last Sunday, as we discussed about the light. Now, light can mean a lot of positive things, but to simplify it, we said that every time we think, of, think about light, we think of God. Because in 1 John, remember it says, God is light, right? So we want to be able to keep that symbol in our minds. Um, it's sort of like a hieroglyphic, right? Every time we think of light, oh, wow, that's God. And so um, there's a lot of meanings to what we can do with light, a lot of symbolism we can do with light. But uh, I just took John MacArthur's definition of it to kind of simplify it. And what we learn is that light is... 100% truth, right? Um, remember how I talked to you earlier about when you go to a hotel room, you might not be able to see um, the nasty stuff there, but as soon as you put on that dark light, you can see all the stains and everything, right? So light is 100% truth. It brings to light um, what's actually there. In darkness, you can kind of fake things, right? But in light, you can't fake it at all. We also said light was 100% was holy <clears throat> because God is holy. And so uh, we use that as well. We said light is 100% pure. Um, I guess you can kind of like filter light so that it's not 100%, but normally um, light in its form is never, adult, unadult, is never tainted. It's 100% pure. So that's what we said. And then later on, we said that light is 100% life, right? is life. And the reason why I say that is because we would see Jesus use light and life in the same sentence, right? I am the light of the world, right? He who believes in me will have the light of life, right? It would, he would say things like that. But scientifically, that's actually true, right? Because when we look in our world, and remember I read you that scientific fact? It said that, you know, we need light in this world. That's the source of light for us. Because if we didn't have light, then plants wouldn't be able to photosynthesize and give us oxygen, which we need. And they also provide food for, us, for other animals and for other people so that we could also survive. So light is very necessary. If we did not have light coming to this world, literally, there would be darkness and death. Plants would not grow, and we would not have oxygen, right? So light, in a way, uh, symbolizes life. It, 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 it naturally... Uh, helps us see that because that's what we interact in everyday life. So, <clears throat> so we, we, after we talked about that, then we went to the idea of Jesus saying, you are the light of the world, right? What do you mean by that? And, and when we think about light, it, we can almost go on and on and on about what that really means. I mean, I can ask anybody about that and they can give me a, a pretty good interpretation, Right? But um, to simplify that, I just simply said that since Jesus said that he is the lie of the world and then he says you are the lie of the world, then the way to simplify it is that we just be Christ-like. We look like Christ. But then again, you ask yourself, what does that look like, right? What does it look like to look, to, to look like Christ? And, and, and that's also like something that we can go on and on about. We would have to go into the Gospels and see his sacrifice and, and all these great things that he did for people. But um, what I did was um, I oversimplified the idea. And, and I kind of used verses like where it says, um, no one lights up a lamp and hides it under a bushel. In other words, light is meant to be shown. In other words, it's noticeable. 
And so what I did was I used John MacArthur's definition and that if you are going to be the light of the world, that means you're going to be walking in the light. And to walk in the light is to, um, <clears throat> is to walk in truth, that you expose sin for what it is, whether it be in your life or another person's life. That's what it looks like to walk in the truth. And it's very uncomfortable. You can offend people by walking in the light. Why? Because it says in scriptures, men love darkness rather than light. They don't want to be exposed. So walking in the light uh, has the idea of walking in truth. And then later on, the next verse says, um, no one wants to stay in darkness, but wants to come into the light so that his deeds may be shown and that God could be glorified. And one of the ways that you walk in the light is to walk in holiness before God. It says in 1 Peter, be holy for I am holy. And so not only as we allow the light to convict us of any sin in our lives, right, to show us the truth of who we really are, then we aim to live a holy life in, in an act of repentance, right? We make an honest effort uh, to live holy and pleasing to God, right? So that's what we said about uh, last Sunday's sermon. So we ended that thought, and now we're going into a new thought. And the new thought goes, goes like this. Um, Don't think that I came into this world to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That's the idea. And then the next three verses following that are sort of like the exposition, or sort of like um, the details that expound on that verse. So think of Matthew 5, 17 as like the thesis statement, and then the next three verses are sort of like the ones that support it, right? That's what it looks like. Um, unfortunately, like uh, that's going to take a while, so I'm going to save those three verses of exposition for the next Sunday because I want us to get a good handle of what this thesis statement implies, okay? Uh, what we're going to be doing today is, uh, uh, is answering this one question. What did Jesus mean when he said Matthew 5, 17? What did Jesus mean when he said Matthew 5, 17? So let me go ahead and read that to you. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Now again, I want to repeat the question so that we have the thought of why we're doing the sermon. The question in your mind should be this. What did Jesus mean when he said this? So when we start dissecting this verse, highlighting phrases, and then talking about it in length, it's because we are answering that question. What did Jesus mean? Now, the most elementary interpretation of this verse is simple. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets, and that's it. That's the most simplest of all, right? Now, if we are thinking carefully, though, the next question to ask is this. Why would anyone think that Jesus came to destroy the law and the prophets? If Jesus, why did Jesus say, don't think like that, right? Why would he say that? Why would anyone think that way, right? And so what I want you to do, what I want you to understand, it's throughout the Gospels, there were people that actually thought that he was going to destroy the law. Okay, so let me go ahead and read to you those passages so you have an idea, right? In Matthew 12, 9 through 10, Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, how will it not lay hold of it and lift it out? I want you to see how Jesus did not come to destroy, but to fulfill it, okay? I want you to feel that, okay? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him, how they might destroy him. And I want you to see the beauty in this language. That's in Matthew 12. This is after Matthew chapter 5. Jesus did not come to destroy. Well, you see, the Pharisees came to destroy him. See that? Now, I want, I want you to see that 
the nice poetry there. So in this passage, the Pharisees thought that Jesus broke the fourth commandment, keeping the Sabbath day holy, or at least that's what they convinced themselves that Jesus did. Now, how do I know that's the fourth commandment? Okay, so this is a mnemonic that'll help you. The fourth commandment says, um, you shall keep the Sabbath day holy. You want to know why? Because when you take the number four and you flip it around, it looks like one of our chairs there on Sunday. So that's how I remember, oh yeah, you shall keep the Sabbath day holy. All right? So another one that you can do is number two, right? Number two, what does that look like? That looks like a person that's bowing down, right? So that, so number two is actually, you shall not have any graven images or bow to graven images before me. So I learned that from the way of the master, you know? Just thought I'd give that to you. And number six, number six looks like a bomb, right? So number six is, uh, thou shalt not kill, <laughs> right? So you have all these little mnemonics that you can get from these little numbers. Uh, number five, right? Number five, if you flip it around, it looks like a parent doing this, right? So that means honor your father and mother, right? So you do little weird things like that. Number three, number three looks like your lips. You see the three, it looks like a lips. So you shall not, you shall, number three is, um, you shall not, um, you shall keep God's name holy. What was that name like? Yeah, can't black, um, don't take his name in vain, right? You shall not take his name in vain. So that's number three. So what's that? Number one, um, number one is you have no other God before me. There's only one God, right? <laughs> so you, you understand? The, 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 it's almost like, I don't know how, how it happens, but God kind of like built, built it in the system. Um, number 10, you have to be a little bit creative, okay? So number 10, you have to like turn it around. So there's like an, a, a zero down here. And at the top, you got to kind of like draw a diamond on it. And that means thou shalt not cover covet your neighbor's things. Okay, so that's covetousness. That's number 10. Number eight, you guys know number eight? So number eight, you turn it around, right? Looks like burglar eyes. So thou shalt not steal, right? So that's number eight, yeah. Number seven, number seven is an interesting one. You gotta be creative with it. Number seven, when you take number seven, you gotta add a, more sevens and then draw a heart on top of it. And that means thou shalt not commit adultery. Because, you know, breaking somebody's heart is committing adultery, right? So you have all these cool mnemonics. I think I gave you all the Ten Commandments, right? I think I just did. So that's how you kind of remember certain things. Wait, what's nine? Number nine. Number nine, uh, when you turn it around, right, and then you draw a snake, it looks like a, a snake's little lips, right? So that means thou shalt not lie, because that's exactly what Satan did in the Garden of Eden, right? So, so that's what you do with number nine. You kind of flip it around. You see nine, it looks like a curled tail of a snake. And you draw a snake on top of that. All right, so anyway, so we see here that the Jews were accusing Jesus of breaking the Sabbath, right? So that was their deal. They wanted to kill him. Here's another passage. Mark 2, 5 through 7. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes are sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus with themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. In this case, Jesus broke the law by doing something God can only do, forgiving a person's sin. And to the Jewish rulers, that was blasphemy. But Jesus demonstrates that he's God by healing the paralytic man. And you would think that this would be enough for them to repent from their mindset. But no, they still believe that Jesus broke the law through blasphemy. The Sabbath and blasphemy are the two big reasons why the rulers of the Jews believe that he was breaking God's law. They were so passionate about these issues 
to the point that they wanted Jesus dead. We see in John 5, 16 through 17, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So you see, they wanted to kill him because of the things on the Sabbath. And then Jesus said, but Jesus answered and said, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, this Jew sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So to them, that was blasphemy. And so those are the two reasons. They saw Jesus as breaking the law. Blasphemy became such a huge issue when it comes to breaking God's law, so much that the Jews really focused on killing Jesus for blasphemy. Jesus says, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again, to stone him. And Jesus answered him, Many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For not a good work do we not stone you. For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. This will be the biggest reason why Jesus will be arrested and tried wrongfully. Blasphemy becomes sort of like the biggest thing for them and how, God, how Jesus broke the law. So we read in Matthew. Remember, in Matthew, we just read in Matthew chapter 5, I did not come to destroy. And now we're seeing the Jews saying, I'm going to destroy you because you broke the law. So we see it here. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by... <coughs> By the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes. Remember, hold on a bit here. Let's talk for the Levitical class. Were the, was the high priest allowed to tear his clothes? You guys remember? That's right. But this guy did that. So here's the irony, right? They thought that they were keeping the law, but they weren't really keeping the law. And their actions are almost showing that. Okay? You're not allowed to do that, but the high priest did that. It's a good, good response, um, Gary. So the, high, so the high priest, right, tore his clothes, saying, he has spoken blasphemy. That's, uh, that's such an oxymoron. You say somebody is breaking the law, but you're a high priest breaking the law too, right? That is so ironic. But isn't that beautiful poetry, though? It's so weird. But anyway, what further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. So when Jesus told them, you know, you guys look like whitewashed sepulchers, man. You look so good in the outside, but inside you're dead man's bones. It's like you are seeing that now being portrayed in this passage. And we will stop with the Bible references here and return to the question, why did Jesus say, do not think I came to destroy the law and the prophets? Remember, he said all this before all this craziness started to happen. And based on what we see in the Gospels, Jesus said this in advance because he knew that the rulers of the Jews would accuse him of breaking the law. Later on, when you read the book of Acts, the Jewish rulers will use the same reason for his disciples. The rulers said Jesus' disciples were encouraging people to break the law. Because Jesus is God, he foreknew their response and made it clear for everyone at the mountain that he didn't come to destroy the law. So don't think like that. He commands us not to think like that. In other words, it's wrong to think that Jesus came to destroy the law and the prophets. That's the command. And unfortunately, the rulers of the Jews disobeyed that command because they didn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If there, Okay, now I'm going to digress a little bit. If there's any lesson you can learn from here today, it's this spiritual concept. Disobedience is the fruit of no faith. Disobedience is a fruit of no faith. In other words, if you lack faith, then you will also be disobedient. Okay? 
if you lack faith, then you will also be disobedient. You, I want you to understand that because, remember, in the New Testament, it emphasizes justified by faith, right? In Hebrews, it talks about faith, right? It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I want you to understand that concept because disobedience is the fruit of that, is the fruit of having no faith. So let me go ahead and explain to you that. Um, that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. They believed what Satan told them. They had faith in what Satan told them. Um, <clears throat> Satan told them indirectly that God was holding back the best for them by not allowing them to eat of the knowledge of good and evil. He tempted them, and they put their faith in Satan's words. And as a result of that, they disobeyed God by eating of the knowledge of good and evil. They, they lacked faith that God was doing good for them. And because they lacked faith in that, they disobeyed. I mean, that's kind of how I feel when my mom and dad tell me, no, I can't do that, right? I feel like they're out, of their, they're out for their own interests. They're not after my own interests, right? They're not looking for my own good. So the result of my, my, me lacking in faith in my parents is a result of disobedience. Okay? That's sort of like the root of it. So just remember, we disobey because we don't believe. That's the source. And the converse is also true. We obey because we believe. So when you look at the Pharisees, right, what we charge the Pharisees is unbelief. They did not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And as a result of that, they were disobedient, right? So that's the fundamental spiritual concept that I want you guys to learn. A lot of it is faith, right? When you believe, you will obey. When you don't believe, then you will disobey, okay? All right, so let's go back to the question. Why did Jesus tell us not to think he came to destroy the law and the prophets? Why did he say that? Because he already knew that the rulers of the Jews would say things like that about him. <clears throat> so Jesus commands us not to think that way. It's bad thinking. Excuse me. <clears throat> now let's continue exploring this question. What did Jesus mean when he said Matthew 5.17? It says here, do not think that I came. I want you to focus on that. That I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. So let me share with you a quote here from a commentary that I highly respect. I came is a significant expression. It is not one that a person would normally use of himself. It will have a meaning like came into the world or came from God and points to a consciousness of mission. Jesus had a special place and a special function, and that was not concerned with abolishing the law. So Jesus makes it perfectly clear that his life purpose is, isn't, to, isn't to overturn the law or the prophets. So I want you to go, and I'm going to put this all together in one sentence, okay? So let's all put it together in one sentence. Jesus says, don't even entertain in your mind that my life purpose was to destroy the law and the prophets. Don't you dare even think that way. That's the passion effect that we should get from this verse here. Don't think like that, right? Don't think like that. And then everything else will follow. The next three verses will follow from that passionate idea, okay? Let's continue on in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to destroy, okay? We're going to focus on that term, to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So I want us to explore this term. It has a strong implication, and some Bible translations use the term abolish instead of destroy. It says here in, my com um, in one of my favorite commentaries, his verb abolish is a strong one and indicates doing away entirely with the law. The law strictly denotes the Pentateuch, and that is its meaning here. So the original Greek term for destroy or abolish is kataluo. It's where you get a uh, kataluo. Like ka catastrophe? Kataluo. Yeah. So it, it's that way. It's to, it's to loosen. It means to loose, and it is used um, 
in reference to demolishing the temple as an example. So when they say destroy, I want you to imagine the temple being destroyed, right? So I didn't come to destroy. I, that's not my life purpose. Okay, that's the effect of that term. So Jesus never had the intention to tear down the law, which in this case refers to the first five books of the Bible. And this is a good time to transition to what the law meant to the Jewish nation. Okay? Oh, man, this guy, dude. Thank you. You love me way too much, my brother. Okay. So the first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we refer to those books as the Pentateuch, right? Penta meaning five, right? Like Pentagon, right? So pen and then Tuch, that one's a little bit difficult to get out of. But Tuch actually means tool. It's almost similar to technique or technology, okay? So Pentateuch, right? But in this case, it's used as like, it's not the five tools, but more like the five books. Because, you know, a manual is a tool too, you know, right? It instructs us on how to use something. So the, it's more of like a, an instructional book. So the five books. And <clears throat> the first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We refer to those books as the Pentateuch. It simply means five books. And for the Jew, they refer to these five books as the Torah, right? Torah in Hebrew means law. Okay, so Pentateuch, Torah, those are two... Those are the same thing. Different words, but they mean the same thing. Now, your next question should be this. Why is the Pentateuch or the Torah so important to the Jew, right? That's the next question to ask. Why is that so important? So let me share with you a Jewish perspective in this matter. The principal message of the Torah is the absolute unity of God, his creation of the world, and his concern for it and his everlasting covenant with the people of Israel. The Pentateuch both embodies the heritage of the Jewish people, retelling its history, setting forth its guiding precepts, and foretelling its destiny, and carries universal messages on monotheism and social conduct, which have had tremendous impact on the Western civilization. <clears throat> now, I'm going to simplify it, oversimplify it again. Now, I want you to understand why the Jewish leaders made a big deal out of the law. The law, the Torah, or the Pentateuch, wasn't just a simple rule book or an instruction manual. It was more than that. The law was their identity with God. It talked about their creator and their everlasting covenant with God. That everlasting covenant is like a marriage contract. Remember how I showed to you guys about, um, I think it was something Vanderlaan? And it was about going to the mountain with the Ten Commandments and how that was a wedding ceremony. I don't know if all of you guys were here. Remember I showed you that video? So the law was like that. It was like their wedding vows. So if you're going to go ahead and do away, it's like, ah, you don't do away with that. You crazy? This talks about my relationship with God. And so that's why they were vehement about it. You understand? That's why they were like that. All right. Um, um. It also helped them understand what is good and bad. Destroying the law is like someone burning our Bible. It's sacrilege. No one should ever burn the Bible because his word means so much to us, it tells us about how we relate to our God. So when you get when you when you see someone kind of like deviating it, deviating from that, then you stand up. That's why I get crazy too. I, I, I understand how Pharisees are. So for example, when people start saying things like, oh, Jesus is not God, man, I go off, right? I'm like, you can't say that, right? And then they, they start showing me a, a, where it says, and in the beginning was a word, and the word was God, and the word was a God. I get mad about that, right? Because they're messing around with God's word. Or in other words, it's, if you want to look at the Bible as like my Torah, and they're messing with it, I get mad, right? So that's how they were feeling, right? But what they didn't understand, though, is that they were being hypocrites themselves. And they were also wicked. They couldn't see it. Their love for the Torah was horribly misplaced. They thought they loved God, but in reality, they really loved themselves. Okay? So that's what was happening, and Jesus was trying to show them that. 
But anyway, I digress. What I wanted you to get is to understand why they were so crazy about the law, right? And we're, in a way, we're kind of similar, right, when it comes to our Bible. Now, you should, now <clears throat> you should also understand that Jesus' purpose was never to destroy the law. Jesus never intended to destroy the Jews' identity in God, okay? So let's go ahead and accumulate what we just learned in one sentence. Get it out of your mind that my life's purpose was to uh, was not was to obliterate. Uh, get out of your mind that my life's purpose was to obliterate your identity with God. That was not my life's purpose. Get it out of your mind. All right. So that's what we're trying to get at here. And now we go on to the prophets. What are the prophets? Do you not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets? I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now the question is, what did Jesus mean by mentioning the prophets? Before I get to that answer, I want to share another life principle. So I'm going to digress from that point, okay? And, to, and what I'm going to say is that if you're going to really learn deeply, it begins with the questions you ask. If you want to learn deeply, it begins with the question you ask. For example, the era we live in is no longer called the Stone Age or the Bronze Age or the Industrial Age. It's called the Information Age. Um, <clears throat> everything we do in life revolves around data. When I say data, I mean digital electronics. I mean credit cards, bank accounts, bill payments, etc. Everything you interact with finds its source in data. Businesses use data to help predict what customers want and invest their time and energy with the patterns they see in their data. But here's what you want, but here's what you want to know. How do businesses make data work for them? And the answer is this, by asking a question. When they have a whole lot of data, they ask a question. And that's how it, it works for them. So let me use an example. Let's say that you own a pool business. Sorry, Kuyajun. Do you think you want to start your business in Alaska? While it's still possible to do so, you'll find it's very difficult to do, do it because common sense tells us that people who own pools normally live in climates that have hot weather. So a pool business person, um, so as a pool business person, you would collect all the data in the world or in the United States and ask this question. What are the top five states in the United States that have the most pools? So the computer programmer creates a query that answers that question and also creates a dashboard to help you quickly access that information. What's a query? A query is a simple table that organizes your answer to your question. So remember my question is, what's the top five states that have the most pools, right? So I, I created a fictional thing. Okay, I created a fictional thing. So, so don't take these numbers because they're fake. All right? They're fake. So, you know, you get California at 9.27 million. You know, Texas. You know, you can, see the, you can see the numbers, right? Now, the figures here are fictional, like I said earlier. I made it all up, but, but I'm doing this so you understand the importance of asking a question. If I ask, what states have the highest number of pools, my table would probably have like 50 rows. And while that might not be a lot, it starts to matter when you start dealing with a lot of cities. You won't be able to read all that. So when you ask the right question or make the right query, you simplify your answer so you can understand how you can direct your business. In this case, I simplified it to the top five states. Right? Can you imagine like um, asking that big old question and then you have all this information, like 100 lines of, t of row, like 100 rows to read. Man, you're not going to read all that. And in this case, I ordered it, right? But what if it wasn't ordered? Man, that's like consuming to go read all that stuff, right? So asking the right question is going to help you in your business. That's what they all do. That's why they create these tables. That's why they create dashboards, which I'll explain what that is later, okay? So anyway... Um, asking the right question. Now, suppose that this table wasn't ordered, because I ordered it for you, so right? So if you ask this question, uh, what's your decision as a business person? Where are you going to start your business? California, right? 
You know, your best bet's in California, or maybe in Texas, or maybe in Florida. Maybe I might find some success in Illinois and Ohio, but I don't want to do that, right? I want to go where the big fish are. So I, I choose those top three states. Now suppose that table wasn't ordered, right? Suppose that it wasn't in order. In other words, it wasn't nicely placed from greatest to least, but it was all over the place. That means you couldn't look at the top row and access your answer right away. You would literally read row by row and determine which state is best for you. That's work, right? A lot of mental work. That wastes time, right? So this is what a dashboard is, a dashboard concerning your query. Uh, if a query is a table, a dashboard is a picture of a table that helps you access your answer much faster. So here's an example. So instead of showing you this table, right, and you say, hey, can you give me the top five states that have a lot of pools? You see this pie chart, right? And immediately you're like, oh, man, I want to see which. It looks like California has the biggest piece of the pie, right? So I'll go with that. And what's this other state? Oh, that's, Illinois, uh, that's, uh, that's Florida there, and that's Texas. Okay, so I want the bigger pieces of the pie. I look at these small pieces. I'm like, I don't want to go there, right? So that's what a dashboard is. Without even looking at numbers, right, you just immediately see exactly how you want that answer to your question. Just, just right off the bat, you look at it. And it saves you a lot of time. So that's what businesses do. Okay? They gather all this data, but that data doesn't mean anything unless you ask the right question. And when you ask the right question, then that data can work for you and you're able to make better decisions. Right? So um, what they'll do now is that, I guess, when they want to go into more details, they'll look at a table or query. Right? They'll kind of read line by line to see if they can discover a, a, another pattern. Uh, but most of the time, when you wake up in the morning, they're going to go look at their dashboard, right, immediately. What it's, what, like, for example, what, what, I have a store. What's the, what's, the top, what's the top product that sells all the time, right, in, 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 the, uh, in the whole year? And you look at that product, and then you find out, hmm, maybe I, I shouldn't buy most of this product anymore. Maybe start investing more in this, have more of this in stock. Then you can go by month, right? Uh, which product sold the most in that month, right? Because sometimes some products won't be sold in a particular season. But maybe during pool season, this product gets sold most of the time, right? So you start stocking up. So how do you think uh, Walmart operates, right? They operate by that data. Oh, man, Easter's coming up, right? Put a lot of candy in there, you know, put a lot of Easter decorations in there, a lot of plastic eggs, right? Christmas is coming up. So they do all that stuff, and it's, dri it's data-driven. Right? They, that's how they see things. And I want you to understand it's because they ask the right question. So again, uh, without numbers, you can totally tell. Now, I think I already went, that, well, went over that with you. So let me go to the real deal. So the same thing goes with the Bible you read. You can read the words in the Bible, but if you don't have a question that's important to you, all these words will go through one ear and out the other. And you'll find yourself confused and not understanding what you're reading. You just flooded your brain with data without meaning. So some of you might ask, but Pastor Anthony, I don't have a question. Can you give me, can you give me a question? And so my answer is, no, I'm not going to give you a question. That kind of question is reserved for prayer. If you find yourself without a question, then pray to God asking, God, please give me direction on what I need to know for my life. I don't have a question, but I want one. Can you give me a question, Lord, so I can read this? Um, and one of the greatest things about the Bible is that you don't need to have an initial question to get the most out of it. From my experience, when you sincerely ask the Lord for direction, God gives you the question while you're reading, and then you have a sense of direction as you read. And it's exhilarating. It's like going on a spontaneous road trip on God's truth. So anyway, I wanted to give you that life truth to help you on your life's journey. But when it comes to a lot of things in your life, you know, it always starts with a question, right? And so you ask the right question, and the same thing applies to the scriptures. Always have a question, because if you don't have a question, then you won't know that quest you have, okay? If you don't have a question, then you don't know what quest you have. So I don't know, I mean... I was just kind of playing around. So if you don't have a question, then you're going to say, ano question, 
You know, like you'd say things like that. You, you just don't know, right? So um, what did Jesus mean by mentioning the prophets? So the, now I'm going back to the main point, right? What did Jesus mean by, go, uh, by asking what do you mean by the prophets? So here's a commentary to help us. The Jews spoke of the former prophets under which heading they included the books from Joshua to, uh, I'm sorry. The Jews spoke of the former prophets under which heading they included the books from Joshua to 2 Kings and the latter prophets, which were the books we speak of as prophecy. The combination is a way of referring to the whole of the Old Testament scripture. And Jesus firmly disclaims any intention of doing away with any part of the Bible. So yes, the prophets refer to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and other major prophetic books, but it also included other books like Joshua all the way to 2 Kings. So when Jesus said the prophets, he meant to include all of the Old Testament scripture. That's his intention. So let me go ahead and review what we just learned by putting it on one sentence. Don't you dare think that my life's purpose is to obliterate your identity with God and the rest of the Old Testament scripture. Okay. Now we go to our final thought. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So what we want to do is understand what he means by fulfill. You already know what destroy is, right? So now we go to fulfill. To fulfill has been understood in three main ways. It may mean that he would do the things laid down in scripture. It may mean that he would bring out the full meaning of scripture. And it may mean that in his life and teaching, he would bring scripture to its completion. In other words, it's really hard to understand what Jesus meant when he said he would fulfill because it means a lot of things. All right. The idea to fulfill means to complete. The problem we encounter is how, is how and to what extent did Jesus fulfill the law and the prophets. And we can literally go on and on how Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets and still not reach the full meaning of what Jesus said. So the best way to handle this is to simplify, which I use Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm going to go ahead and simplify it for you. He fulfilled it in that he kept it during his earthly life. And the standard which was set before man, he was able to attain, and now he is able to make over to you and me, and every believer, his own righteousness. God's standards have not changed, but you and I cannot attain them in our own strength. We need help. We need a Savior. We do need mercy, and we obtain mercy when we come to Christ. In other words, Jesus came to meet all the requirements for us in the law and in the prophets. When Jesus met those requirements, he opened the door so that anyone could fulfill, anyone could fulfill, I'm, I'm sorry, so that anyone could fully identify with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And now the Old Testament scriptures that used to be vague to us, he provided a teacher through the Holy Spirit so we could understand what we're reading. So let's conclude today, um, today's sermon with our final understanding in one sentence. Never ever think that my life's purpose was to obliterate your identity with God and the rest of Old Testament scripture. I didn't come to obliterate, but to bring into completion your identity with God and your understanding of the scriptures through my work on the cross. So that's what we get in that main idea, all right? And to me, I'm telling you right now, that's me oversimplifying it, okay? There's a whole lot more to do that, but what I'm trying to do is to help you get a good handle of it as we go on to the next verses. Because then you're going to understand his passion where he says, he's going to say things like, not even one dot, or, or look, I'm not going to let not a missing dot or missing T, everything, even the dot to the T, I'm going to fulfill all of it. So he's very passionate and poetic about it, right? So I want you to get that effect in the foundational verse before we go down to the next ones. So <clears throat> that's the depth of Matthew 5, 17. I hope you felt the love of God um, that you had through Christ's work in fulfilling the law and the prophets. Amen? So uh, uh, with that being said, uh, let me go ahead and request our ushers to collect our tithes and offerings. So let me request Ocean and Sarah May. And again, the uh, red pouches are for... Um, benevolence offering for uh, Delore.